Mitochondria translation is awesome. So mitochondria, we often think of them as like the powerhouses of our cell. It's where the energy making occurs, but some of that energy making requires protein making. And so translation, the process of making proteins actually happens in our mitochondria as well as all that ATP making. Um, it's, and it's really, really cool. Like we use different um, ribosomes. We have like mitochondrial ribosomes, so the protein making machinery. We have different, um, like the messenger RNAs that they're working on, the protein instructions are really weird they like don't have like the UTRs and the caps and all this weird stuff we even have different tRNAs um so the transfer RNAs that bring the ribosome the amino acids so the protein letter to be added based on that mRNA really really cool stuff um and so today this morning I was just like totally geeking out over this stuff and I've been like researching it um and so I'm gonna show you some different review articles and some different findings as well as um like primary um articles so like the original research and stuff so really really cool stuff um just like kind of random really cool mitochondria stuff so let's dive in so translation is this process where we are making a protein based on the instructions in messenger RNA that is coming from um, transcription where we make a RNA copy of the genes, the DNA instructions. And then in this process of translation, this ribosome complex is going to travel along that messenger RNA and it's going to put in the amino acid, so the corresponding protein letter, that corresponds to what the RNA is telling it to make. And so the RNA tells it what to make in these three letter words um, called codons. So three RNA letters here are gonna match a anti-codon, so a three letter um, sequence in the tRNA, and that tRNA is also going to have an amino acid. As I'll show you as the case with mitochondria, there's actually some kind of like wiggle room, there's more wiggle room um, between the base pairing um, due to modifications of the tRNA. So it's really cool. It lets the mitochondria use um, fewer transfer RNAs. So they only use like 22 um, transfer RNAs, whereas for the um, like our in our cytosol and the eukaryotic ribosomes, they're going to use like 40 to 60 different ones. And so the mitochondria actually use like a, a slightly different um, universal um, genetic code as well. It's really cool. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but first, let's talk about these ribosomes. So I did a post um, a while back about mitochondrial ribosomes. Um, but just so if you want to know more detail, um, you can go there. But basically, the ribosome, no matter where the ribosome comes from, um, from where they were talking prokaryotic, um, so we're talking like bacteria, um, we're talking eukaryotic plants, animal fungi and stuff, um, even in our mammalian mitochondria, um, although they're different, they all have these two subunits. And so they have a large subunit and a small subunit. Um, and basically what happens is that the, what is a mitochondria, first of all? So mitochondria is basically, they're these powerhouses of your cell. They're these membrane-bound compartments inside of your cell where the ATP making is going to take place in this process called oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and so more on this in, an, in other posts too, but ATP is going to be this kind of like how your cells store energy um, because it's like you have these three negatively charged phosphate groups all close together. It's kind of like a clamp spring. Um, and then your cells can like, your enzymes and proteins and stuff, they can like spend this ATP um, by breaking this, releasing the spring. And um, that, so yeah, so ATP can be used by all of, in all these different processes and to power them. And so your mitochondria are where you're going to make that ATP. Um, and so this energy making the main type place where you're going to get this ATP is from this oxidative phosphorylation that's going to be happening in your mitochondria. And so your mitochondria have these like um, compartments. Um, so this mitochondria is this membrane bound compartment inside of your cells. So we tell all these type of things. We have these membrane bound compartments inside our cells. We call these organelles. So a membrane is, or a mitochondria is an organelle. And your cells actually have a multiple mitochondria and different cells have different numbers of mitochondria. Um, and you can actually, it's, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on with mitochondria. But anyway, 
So you have these mitochondria and then inside of the mitochondria, you're going to have this oxidative phosphorylation happening. And you're also going to have some translation happening. So we're not, most of our translation in our cells is gonna be happening out in the cytoplasm. So basically outside of the mitochondria, outside of the nucleus where the, pro, where the genes are, it's gonna be happening out in there. Um, but there's going to be some translation that's actually happening in your mitochondria. And in particular, you're going to be translating some of the proteins that are needed for this oxidative phosphorylation. And this mitochondrial translation is going to be happening by these mitochondrial ribosomes. So these um, mitochondrial ribosomes are going to be like specialized in kind of like making those um, proteins. And so they actually associate with the membrane where these proteins are made. And then with the help of some other proteins, they're gonna actually, when the protein is getting made, it's gonna be inserted into the membrane so that the protein can fold up all normally. Because um, the parts of it that are used to this lipidy environment, so it's like fatty environment, you can kind of, if you're making it, you can directly make it into there. That'll help it fold. So it's not like that oil and water stuff where the protein's gonna like freak out in this fold. Okay, we'll get more into this stuff later, but getting back to the idea that you have these mitochondrial ribosomes and that you have mitochondria. So the reason why you have mitochondria is because, so eukaryotic cells, um, they have membrane bound compartments, including mitochondria, and the way that they got these mitochondria was by like swallowing a prokaryotic cell. So you have an ancient ancient cell that um, didn't have mitochondria and then it swallowed a bacteria. Um, and then it kind of took advantage of the bacterial um, system and it got rid of a bunch of stuff and it kept a bunch of stuff. Um, it kept some stuff. And so what one of the things it kept was the ribosome. And so the ribosome from the mitochondria is actually more similar to the prokaryotic ribosome than your cytosolic ones are, but it's different too. So it actually has more proteins um, and less of the RNA. Um, and so this, the ribosomes are these complexes of proteins and RNA, and it's actually the RNA that does a lot of the heavy duty lifting um, of actually doing the catalysis. So getting the um, amino acids to add to the growing chain. When you have, um, but you have these proteins too. And in the mammalian my ribosomes, what you see is you get this expansion of the proteins and the, uh, like a contraction of the RNA. Um, and so you have these different, um, and you'll see that it's smaller in size than both the eukaryotic cytosolic and the prokaryotic ribosomes. And so if you're wondering about these sizes, this is from like a sedimentation coefficient, which basically you spin these things down and see the, fat, the heavier it is, the, the like, the further it'll sink. Um, and so then you can separate them this way. And then the sedimentation coefficient, it's not, to, it's, so it's related to like the shape and the weight um, but it's not, it's not like linear. So that's why these don't add up. So if that's bothering you, that's why. Okay. So basically what's going to happen is that we have these different mitochondria. These mitochondria are going to be more similar to the prokaryotic ribosomes and the cytosolic ones. Why am I telling you about this is because as I mentioned in another post, um, basically this means that some of the antibiotics that target bacterial ribosomes um, can bind to the mitochondrial ones and mess up things that are going on in your mitochondria. And this can actually cause problems, especially if people have um, a genetically disproportionate a genetic predispositioning mutation or whatever, where basically there's a mutation in their ribosomal, their mitochondrial ribosome, mole RNA, that then makes them makes it even more bacteria-like in the place where some of the antibiotics it binds, um, like aminoglycosides. And this can cause things like deafness. Um, and so I'm just bringing this up again because I just saw this recent preprint um, on the structural basis for the streptomycin. So one of these antibiotics binding to the mitochondrial ribosome. And so they have the structure of it bound to the small subunit. So really cool stuff. And I'm looking forward to seeing it published. Okay, um, so that is that stuff, um, but it, so in a lot of ways, however, the mitochondria is like totally different from bacteria. And so inside of mitochondria, we have a totally different system. Um, and we actually have, so we, some of the things that are needed in the mitochondria are encoded by a mitochondrial um, genome. So the mitochondria actually has its own genome. It has its own DNA. Um, and then your, you have the nuclear DNA, which is like out in your nucleus. 
So here is a really good review article I found. Um, and so I'm going to show you some figures from that as well as some of the notes that I took. Um, and so basically inside of your ride, my, inside of the mitochondrial, they've gotten rid of anything that they don't need and then kept things that they do need. And then they actually, some of the things that they do need, they actually import in from the nucleus. So actually a lot of stuff. So in like all those proteins that make the ribosomes, those are actually coming from nuclear from nuclear DNA and they're made in the cytoplasm and then they're imported into the mitochondria. The mitochondrial genome, it, what it has is all it has is it has mitochondrial, it has messenger RNAs. So instructions for making um, proteins. And so it has, it has 11 of these that are going to code for 13 proteins as I'll show you. And these are all going to be proteins that are involved in um, the mitochondrial ATP generation, like we were talking about. Then it also has the mitochondrial tRNAs, and then it also has the ribosomal RNA. So the proteins are coming from outside, um, but the ribosomal RNA is going to be coming from inside in terms of how we make up the ribosome. And what's really, really cool is that the way, well, there's a lot that's really, really cool, but let's focusing on the mitochondrial mRNAs first. Um, and so basically, here's a comparison of bacterial, mitochondrial, and like cytosolic messenger RNAs. So one of the um, first things that stands out about these mitochondrial messenger RNAs is that they, most of them, um, I'll get into the most part in a second, but most of them don't have like five prime and three prime UTR, so untranslated regions. So typically what happens is that when our, in our cytoplasm, what happens is that you have this gene and it's to the DNA and it has these in exons, so the regions that have protein making instructions that are separated by these introns, so the regions that don't have any protein making instructions. And these get spliced, but when you make an RNA copy of them, those introns get spliced out. So they get cut out. And then you get this mature messenger RNA. Um, well, once you add a, like a five prime cap, um, so this modified um, nucleotide, so this modified RNA letter, and a polyadenosine tail, so a string of the letter A. And in before that, between that cap and the start of the, the open reading frame, so basically the instructions for making the protein, um, you have this five prime UTR. So this is a five prime end, this is a three prime end, the five prime UTR is an untranslated region. So it doesn't have protein making instructions. So you have some regulatory information here, and then you have some at the, five, at the three prime end as well. What happens, however, is that in the mitochondria, forget all about that. So we do not have in our mitochondrial, um, well, there's a couple of little ex exceptions, but basically we don't have the, the five prime and the three prime UTR. And most of these are gonna use this thing, this cool thing called like leaderless translation where they start like right at the end. So they start like right, they have a start codon. So the start signal for the ribosome, like right at the end. And this is like uh, really, really cool. And we'll get more into that in a second. Um, they don't have that cap like the, um, the cytoplasmic ones do. And they don't have a shine delgarno sequence, an SDS like the bacteria might messenger RNAs often do. Um, and so basically these CAP and the SDS, they're both important for basically find, getting the ribosome to get onto the messenger RNA and start making it. Um, and so the ribosome, the, the, like the ribosome binding site um, with this like SDS, so the sequence that's kind of like complementary to part of the bacterial ribosome is going to help it know where to get onto the messenger RNA and start making protein. In your nuclei, um, in your cytoplasm, you have the cap is going to help recruit the ribosome and different things and help it find the start sequence and all of that. Mitochondria, basically, it just starts right from the end. Um, and um, this is basically this like it's called like leaderless translation. Um, and it's thought to be kind of like a super duper ancient <laughs> method or whatever. I mean, it's pretty much as simple as you can get, but there's a lot of research going on as to how it actually does this. But there's actually some proteins um, that can kind of like help it get started. And this process is in like um, getting studied in more detail. So I'm looking forward to uh, more coming from all of this. Um, but I'm not an expert on that at all. 
Okay. But so first of all, and we also don't have those introns. Um, so we don't have those introns. We don't have those stuff on the end. So the reason how the, but, so we don't have those introns. However, we do have this is going to get made in this. We have the, so we don't have introns in the messenger RNAs, but actually uh, this RNA, like a lot of it is going to be made as this polycystronic transcript. So basically you have the instructions kind of like back to back to back. So you don't just have like protein, protein, protein. You have like tRNA, protein, tRNA, protein. And then when you process out the tRNA, so we process out those transfer RNAs, now you're left with these separate transcripts for the different proteins. And this is why you can have it so that you're basically, you don't have any excess information that needs to get removed. Um, and this allows the mitochondria to be really um, compact in how they store their information. Speaking of how they store their information, because the mitochondria have their own like DNA and because you have multiple mitochondria per cell, you can actually have like slightly different version like variation so like polymorphism so like things like single nucleotide polymorphisms little polymorphisms or SNPs um and also when you like inherent mitochondria like when you're being like you are made um basically you can have different proportions of mitochondria coming in and you can have like this chroma this um oh what's the word it's um 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 Mosaicity. You can have mosaicity. Basically, you have different versions of this mitochondrial RNA or DNA. So it's really, really interesting stuff. And it can also impact um, like mitochondrial diseases um, and how severe they can be. So a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, yeah. So mitochondrial, um, if you have mutations in the mitochondrial um, DNA, or if you have mutations in some of the things that are needed in the mitochondria, like the mitochondria, the ribosomal mitochondria protein parts that are brought into the mitochondria, then you can um, have genetically based uh, mitochondrial diseases, and these can be really serious because the mitochondria are so important. Okay, um, and so basically you only have, you have a 13 proteins that are made in the mitochondria from mitochondrial messenger RNA, but you only have 11 messenger RNAs. And this is because there are two that are bisystronic. So before we talked about like polycystronic and then those got cut out um, from cut apart from one another, these two are actually protein protein back to back and they stay together. This NDL4, ND4L4 and um, this ATP86. And so they can basically trans translate one of them and um, then translate the other one. And so there was a cool paper um, where they actually figured out that you needed to translate the first one in order to translate the second one. And they did this by importing in this like morpholino. So this thing that was gonna block the making of one of them. And then you, they found that you needed to initiate the translation at the first one in order to get translation at the second one. So that was pretty cool. Okay, um, so they don't have that five prime UTR really. Um, they don't have the cap. There's a couple that have a little bit at the end, but this is like just one or two or three nucleotides. So not like the really long five prime UTRs that we see with our cells. I mean, with our cytoplasm, um, make ones. Okay, but they do have the poly A tail. And so that poly A tail um, is gonna get added by this mitochondrial poly A polymerase or PAPD. Um, and what's really cool about this is that in some cases, in like seven out of the 11 cases, this A is actually going to turn to provide the stop codon. So it's going to provide the instructions for telling the mitochondria to stop. So they only have a partial stop codon. Um, and so basically the ribosome, when it, there wouldn't be a stop signal. But then the A, when it adds the A, now you complete the stop um, signal. You complete that codon that has the instructions that tells the ribosome when to stop. And as we'll talk about, um, these stop codons um, are a little different um, in the case of the mitochondria. They use slightly different things. Um, but this is going to complete the stop codon. Okay, what else did I want to say? Okay, um, the, this polydenylation is promoted by this protein complex, um, this like LRPPRC slurp thing. Um, and it is going to relax the messenger RNA secondary structure so that the, so the polymerase can do its job. Um, and 
I don't know why ND6 is not um, polydentylated, but it has this non-coding part at the end instead. Okay, so the, it's not just the mitochondrial messenger RNAs that are weird, our mitochondrial tRNAs are also weird. Um, so first off, there are a few of them. So there's like only 22 of them, um, as opposed to our 40 to 60-ish cytoplasmic ones. And I say the range because I was having a problem finding like an actual number because we actually have a bunch of, of inactive um, tRNA genes in our genome. So they don't actually make tRNA, but they were made from, they're like co copies of the tRNA genes that are now like non-functional. Um, the ones in our mitochondria are made from that TR, that mitochondrial DNA. And their structures are more diverse than the ones that are out in our cytoplasm and they include some like weird truncation. So normally you have this kind of um, thing that looks like this. And with in the mitochondria, you can get some weird, weird looking ones that have like shortened ends and cut off parts and stuff. Um, they also get post-transcriptionally modified. Um, and so this is a cool paper. Um, this complete chemical structures of human mitochondrial tRNAs. And so they went through a ton of work, um, really like whoa stuff, um, where they purified and characterized the modifications of all of the um, mitochondrial tRNAs. Um, and, and when they did this, they, um, they, they were able to figure out kind of the basis for some of the functional um, things that we know about how the tRNA influences the mitochondrial genetic code. So we typically think about the genetic code as being like universal. And so you have this universal code where the codon is going to spell the same amino acid no matter what type of cell you put it in. But because of some modifications in the tRNA, the mitochondria can actually use a slightly different code. So instead of having AUA spell isoleucine in the, in the mitochondria, it's going to spell methionine instead. And instead of UGA serving as a stop codon, um, which it does in the, in the cytoplasm, instead in here, it's going to um, spell tryptophan, so one of the amino acids. Uh, but conversely, AGA and AGG normally spell arginine, but in the mitochondria, they serve as stop codons. And in this paper, they show some of the um, chemical basis for this. Um, there's actually like modifications um, that are present in the anticodon region. So in the part of the tRNA that's actually going to recognize the, um, that is going to be like complementary to the, to the anti to the codon in the messenger RNA, it can actually have more like wobbling. Um, so basically, it's less strict in what it needs, and this is going to allow it to use a smaller number of tRNAs to read out the same number of amino acids. So in the genetic code, there's a lot of redundancy. Um, so there's a lot of codons that spell the same thing. And in our cells, we have like a lot more codon, we have a lot more, like we would have individual tRNAs that for these different codons. So they'd recognize all three letters. In the mitochondria, they modify the tRNA so it's less picky. And so it needs to recognize like that first letter that has to be perfect, but then the other ones, it can recognize a couple different things. So it can have this like wobbling. And this is going to allow the mitochondria to use fewer tRNAs in order to translate the same um, amount of things. So these modifications include things like this, like taurinomethyl added to uridine um, and sulfur added to uridine. Um, so it's like thiosulfur modification. Um, so these are gonna let them recognize um, the the, the synonymous um, codon, so the ones that spell the same amino acid. Um, and they also get modified at a bunch of other positions, a bunch of um, modifications for things like stability, efficiency, et cetera. Um, and as for how the translation proceeds, it's um, fairly similar to like translation in terms of, there's some things different about the initiation. Elongation is very similar. Um, there's still some, things about the termination um, and the recycling that are, um, that are get, still getting worked out. And then, um, like I mentioned, you have the ribosomes that are kind of associated with this membrane. And then these proteins are going to, and the lipids are going to help it direct the nascent protein, the nascent chain, the like growing protein in, directly into the membrane so that they can fold where they need it um, and where they'll be happy. Okay, so we talked about 
that. Um, we talked about some of this stuff already with the mitoribosomes. Um, but one other thing I wanted to mention is that there's a crucial part of like bacterial ribosomes called this like 5S rRNA. Um, and mitochondria have ditched it. Um, so in, you had the, um, you in the prokaryotic, you have these three RNAs and one of them is this 5S. In the mitochondria, instead of having the 5S, you have this structural tRNA. So basically they ditch the 5S and they replaced it with a tRNA. Um, so in our cells, this is gonna be like a mitochondrial valine tRNA. Um, this is gonna be embedded in the actual structure. So that's pretty cool. Um, so all this stuff is really cool, but it's also really hard to study. Um, and so there are um, reasons why it'd be tricky to study. Um, so basically they're locked up in the membrane bound structures. So it's hard to get exogenous nucleic acids to them to try to get them to make different things in vivo or in organello. So basically when you purify out those mitochondria, if you were to try to get it's hard to give them different instructions than the instructions that they normally have. So there are ways that we can like transfect things into cells and get things into the cytoplasm, not too hard, but the mitochondria, you've got like those different membranes and it's hard to get things to it. Plus it's already locked inside of the cell. Um, they're a lot less abundant than cytosolic or bacteria ribosomes. Um, and they are membrane associated um, as are the proteins that they make, and they use those weird tRNAs. Um, so I found this good um, recent review article about some of the current methods for studying mitochondrial translation. Um, these involve modifications of some techniques that we've talked about before, including ribosome profiling, where you're trying to see where ribosomes are bound on uh, messenger RNAs and polysome profiling, where you're trying to see how many ribosomes are bound per, um, per messenger RNA. Um, the modified techniques are doing things like separating out the mitochondrial ribosomes from the cytosolic ones based on the differences in their size. You can do this with like a um, multiple you can do, use like gradient centrifugation in order to separate them based on the differences in their size and then um, purify out the RNA that it's bound to um, and sequence it if you, and um, things like that. There are also methods where you can label the growing um, protein, either like with radioactive, um, adding a radioactive amino acid, or now there are uh, methods that are using like adding some like flip chemistry tags. So basically this is a tag that you can put on um, like modified amino acid that's going to then when you add a chemical it's going to allow you to I mean you get this click reaction um, where you have this um, another modification is going to be added on that's going to allow you to like purify it out and um, that sort of thing so um, really cool stuff and yeah I hope, thank you for letting me geek out with you if you're still here um, and yeah, I just thought this stuff was really cool. And so I wanted to talk about it and I will post some links and stuff. Um, and yeah.